I really held on to my identity from before and it took a long time till I realized I didn't need that identity, that I could formulate my own and that this version of me could be better than that. The more I started to let go of those things that made her happy and worked out what made me happy, that's when life started getting better and better and better and better. Hello, I'm Sophie Morgan and I'm a TV presenter, a disability advocate, a writer and an artist. And I'm here with Women's Health UK and this is my body, my story. I was injured when I was 18 years old. I'm now 38 years old. I had just done my A-levels and I had left school and it was the summer of 2003 and I was so excited about everything, about life, about what was next, about who I was gonna be, what I was gonna do. I was so hungry for life, I can't tell you the appetite I had for everything. And I flew to Scotland to get the results and got them did well, well enough to celebrate and well enough to get into the university of, the, of my choice. And that night after the celebration party, I was driving home with a group of friends and I was on the country lanes and there was no lighting on those lanes. I was driving like somebody who doesn't have much experience, uh, cause I didn't. And I had all my friends in the car and I was driving back to an after party. And in the two mile journey between one party and the next, I lost control of the car and I flipped it and it crashed and rolled and spun and landed in a field. And in the crash, in the impact, I broke my cheekbone, my skull was fractured, my eye fell out, my nose was crushed, my jaws were broken, my collarbone snapped and my spine moved enough that the vertebrae were damaged. The vertebrae damaged the spinal cord and I was instantly paralyzed from the chest down. And after that, I was taken to hospital in Scotland where I went into intensive care for about three or four days and they thought I wasn't going to make it. So they sent me down to London to get um, spinal fusion and have my face reconstructed. And at that point I very nearly checked out, but uh, for some miraculous reason I didn't. And I went into rehabilitation in London for four, three or four months. And basically there was no chance of me ever being able to walk again. That was pretty much determined almost instantly because of the damage that I had done. So the journey wasn't to recovery, it was to adapt to the body that was now gonna be the way it was gonna be <laughs> forever. Um, so I have what's called complete paralysis from just below my boobs down. So the learning journey was pretty intense and I was in hospital just learning the basics from how to get dressed, how to get in a wheelchair, how to use a wheelchair, learning how to drive again, uh, learning how to go to the loo, learning how to I mean, you name it, it was like I was a baby and I had to learn everything again, all the life skills. Um, and once I was deemed ready, I was allowed to go home. And that's when, yeah, life began. I love looking back at that beginning of when I started this very long journey to adapting to life as a wheelchair user and as a paraplegic because some really monumental things happened that, that set me on the right course. First was my friends, my girlfriends. They were every bit as ridiculous with me as they always had been. You know, as soon as I came out of hospital, we were going out clubbing, they were picking me up, putting me on speakers. They were wandering around with me drunk. I remember one point we we were out and they were picking me up, they were carrying me to go into a nightclub. And one picked up one leg and the other picked up the other leg. And then they walked in opposite directions and then we all fell over laughing. And it was just so refreshing to not be wrapped in cotton wool and to not be treated like I was other. My friends just put me right back to where I needed to be and helped me find myself and my identity again. My mum was also really instrumental in my recovery. She never ever left my side. She gave me so much strength because she, she was a nurse. So she knew and understood disability and she gave me so much of my tenacity, but also just the confidence to say, yeah, that's gonna be how you have to do things, but that's not gonna stop you. You can just find a way, right? So there was a real confidence in her that I think all this medical stuff and all this understanding of disability, she didn't, she wasn't scared by it. So I wasn't scared by it. For me, it was like the really normal things. Like I, because I was so hungry to live, at that time, I was 18 years old, I had so much to do. I was like, I've got so much to do. Don't get in the way, don't stop me from living. That the minute I felt like I was living again in the way that I would have before, I was just happy. I tried very hard in my book to unpack 
the awakening to the changes in my body. I kind of knew what had happened to my body before anyone had told me. And because I was being kept in this position and I wasn't allowed to sit up, it was quite easy to just sort of forget about what was going on in the rest of my body. But as all the pain subsided and all the wounds started healing up here, I was like, hold on a minute. I haven't had any feedback from the bottom of my body. I can't remember when. And that's when I started to really realize there's something really drastically wrong here. And some the things that are healing, some things aren't healing. And that's when I started to realize that the nurses, when they were coming in to look after me, were doing things to the lower part of my body that I couldn't feel. They were washing me and they were, you know, moving me around. And I was like, oh my gosh. And I didn't verbalize that for some time. I just sort of sat with it and lay with it. And I wasn't able to move, I was so weak. But then eventually it just became really clear that yeah, the damage was serious. And eventually I asked what was going on. And, and then I was told, you're never gonna walk again. But what's interesting about that is that everyone always thinks that's the big thing. You're never gonna walk again. That is nothing compared to the other things that you then have to learn to deal with. I wish instead of saying, you're never gonna walk again, they'd say the other things that you're never gonna do again. You're never ever gonna know when you need to go to the loo ever again. You're never ever gonna know what temperature your body is in. You don't know if you're in pain. You don't know if there's something sharp against your leg or something burning against your leg. They don't say that though, they just say you're never gonna walk again. And you're like, right. And then that's when all hell breaks loose. It's hard to know where to start when thinking about the difficult or unhelpful things that people have said to me over the years. But I think some of the early ones that really left a stain or a mark and really influenced me for the worse. I think we're actually from men. I was really hurt by the men in my life. I should probably say boys, because they were, we were so young and they said some really harmful things. Me not being the, the woman I was before or the girl I was before and not being as sexy or as attractive or as fun. And I found that heartbreaking because yes, my body had changed, but I felt like I could still be the same person. I internalized a lot of ableism myself when I first came out of hospital. I, I, I didn't know what disabled people could do or what we could be. So it didn't take a lot for people to influence me in the wrong way. The messaging that they send you by asking things like, oh, can you have a job? Oh, can, can you live by yourself? Oh, can you drive? I didn't know what I could or couldn't do, but there was always this assumption that I couldn't do stuff. Oh, you can't do that. She can't go traveling. She can't go out with her mates. She can't drink. That stuff was everywhere, all the time. You can't study here. I got told I couldn't study at the college I wanted to go to. She can't study here. It's not accessible. You know, you kind of go, huh, what? Why can't I decide for myself? So that's basically what I did. I had never needed to know my rights as a human being. I've, I've been that privileged. I'd never needed to know what I could or could not do. And then suddenly I had to know. I had to know the laws. I had to know what I could and couldn't do. I had to know how to flex those laws. I needed basically to become a lawyer overnight so I could defend myself. Or I needed to become incredibly articulate and advocate for myself and fight for everything I would ever want to have. And so that's basically what I've done. A couple of days ago, I landed back from America and when I touched down in Heathrow, my wheelchair was basically stored on the airplane, but the attachment I travel with kept in the hold and when I got reunited with that I went to connect it again and uh, it was broken. This isn't the first time that this has happened. It actually happened in February as well where my wheelchair and the attachment both got broken. So technically that's three times that my most important equipment that I cannot live without has been broken and I'm in between emotions. I'm slightly exhausted by it all, but I'm also so galvanized and passionate about making change. The first time this happened, I it triggered a, a campaign and I've been running that campaign now for the last five months. It's called Rights on Flights. And it's looking at the very challenges that disabled people face when they fly, how we can make change, how we can work with the industry to do better? What can we do with the government to make sure that we're more protected? How can we change the laws so that, you know, air, air travel is more accessible? There's a lot to look at, and this is happening on the daily. It happens all the time, all around the world. It's not unusual. It's actually impossible 
for you to live your life if your mobility aid is broken or damaged. You have to give over your wheelchair the minute you arrive at the aircraft door, which means handing over your agency and your independence, everything. It's incredibly disabling. So the way it works is you get transferred onto an aisle chair, which is the small chair that fits down the aisle and it's not self-propelling. So that relies on somebody else, a complete stranger, dragging you to your seat, wherever that might be. And then once you're on board, if you're someone like me who can't stand or mobilize at all without that chair, then you have to rely on that person to come back and bring you the chair when you need to go to the toilet. And it's really, really undignified because the toilets on an aeroplane are really small, as we all know. So try and imagine like transferring into that if you've got, you know, a disability, it's really difficult. And I remember the first time I came out of hospital as a paraplegic, as a manual wheelchair user, and I realized what a privilege it was to not have to think about, you know, how do you go to the loo on an aeroplane? Why, how do you get on an aeroplane? Like, I, you never have to think about that stuff. And suddenly that was all I had to think about. And I didn't know how to do it as a wheelchair user. And all of the problems I faced then still exist now. And it's 20 years later. So there's all these various ways and nuances around how travel is really inaccessible. And my campaign is aiming to try and help enable disabled people know their rights know what they can expect, plan for the worst, um, but hope for the best. You know, I think as women in general, there's always that kind of messaging around, you need to remind yourself you are good enough, you are enough, you are enough. There's a lot of that positive messaging that I think we need to certainly like imbibe. But I think as a disabled woman, you need it in more because it's just like everywhere you go, someone's telling you you're not enough. Working out your identity with a physical disability takes an enormous amount of courage and tenacity and belligerence. You have to decide that you're not going to listen to some of the things that people tell you. You have to work it out for yourself. The moments where I felt that little spark in me that was like a remnant of my soul from my previous life, where I thought, oh, there I am. Oh, they, they were the best. They still are the best, actually. The most wonderful moments. I think now it's changed because now I, I don't need to identify so much with the girl I was once before. But back when I was first adapting to this life, I, you know, if I found myself with my friends in my car, listening to music, driving to a festival or something, I'd suddenly go, oh, there I am, you know? Or if I found myself on an airplane, traveling somewhere and, and going somewhere new and being just, you know, out in the world, it's like, oh, wow, that's, that's me. That's what I wanted to do before. There was all these little threads that came through and sustained me. But the interesting point for me was that I really held on to my identity from before and it took a long time till I realized I didn't need that identity, that I could formulate my own and that this version of me could be better than that. The more I started to let go of those things that made her happy and worked out what made me happy, that's when life started getting better and better and better and better. Yes, I gained a disability, but I, I nearly lost my life. So when I look at the crash and I think about what happened and not me being 18, it was like, I didn't die. Yeah, I'm disabled, but I'm alive. So there's that kind of driving force that makes me so happy. So I think that's kind of how I reconcile some of the, the problems with my disability. It's like, it gave me a lot. And now I've got the best job, the best friends. I've got this amazing life. It's very purposeful and, and fulfilled and Yet, at the same time, it's full of struggle, full of challenge, full of heartache and pain. It's all of the things. I live a full spectrum and I wouldn't have it any other way. Television is a very powerful tool for influencing change. And I got really addicted to the television thing. I was like, I really want to do this. But there was no opportunity for disabled people to work in TV. This was 20 years ago. Every time I tried to become a presenter or tried to do anything in television, I was just told, Unless there's a reason for you being on screen, and so unless it's about disability, why would you be, why would you be the presenter? Why, why you? As those attitudes changed a bit, and then obviously the Paralympics came around, doors opened suddenly, and I went bull dozing through them. I was like, right, there's a window, I'm gonna take it, I really wanna, I really wanna do this. I saw television as just this wonderful weapon through which I could wield societal change. Uh, whether I'm right in that, I'm not sure, but it, that's how I felt about it. I really wanted to get involved in it and it's got a lot easier now. And I think the, the, there's a lot that needs to be done in terms of representation, but I'm really proud of where I'm at. And I think the doors are being opened to more and more people. But I'm always like, love your body no matter what. I don't know if I do that all that well myself. I think if I want to say I celebrate my body, it's by, I don't, 
stop myself from wanting to do quite extreme things. So if I want to, for example, ride a motorbike, I'll find a way to get on an adapted motorbike. I, I, I kind of push the limits of what my body can do without hurting myself. And that allows me to really love my body because there's a lot of limitations that come with being paralyzed. So it's quite easy to focus on the negatives. So I try and like focus on the positives by finding all these amazing things I can do. Music helps me get back into my body. I love dancing, raving actually. Even if I have to like strap my legs onto my chair sometimes, I have to like tie my legs on with a jumper so that I can like jump around and not fall out. Cause I get so, so moved by music. So I love being welcomed into a crowd where I'm not judged as well. Some crowds can be really tricky with you if you're a wheelchair user. Um, be a bit like, what are you doing here? But some crowds are just like, come on in, come and party. And I love that. I swim. Swimming is probably my biggest release. I get the most freedom out of that. And I, I, I move a lot for someone that's paralyzed. <laughs> Sometimes as much as a wheelchair does help me mobilize and is really liberating in that sense, it, there's only so far a wheelchair can go. So I quite like getting out of it and whether that be getting onto another vehicle or machine that can take me further or getting into some water or, you know, getting in the sea, whatever. Like, I just live for that kind of thing. I love pushing the limits of what my body can do. When you live with limitations, whatever they might be, physical, emotional, mental, when you have those certain limitations that you cannot get rid of, if you impose further limitations on yourself, by just getting in your own way. So say being fearful or being anxious or something stopping you. I just feel like you're doubly, I would be doubly d disabling myself if I did that. If I let my fear, for example, stop me from doing something. Fear is something you can overcome. So I had this attitude of like, if I'm scared of something, I do it, which has led me to do some epic things because I'm fearful. People say that to me, they're like, how do you do that? I'm like, I'm terrified the same as you, but I just decided to go and do it. Because if I don't, then I'm kind of, my, my life is even more restricted. In my work, I've, I've taken some really big risks and some really big leaps into spaces that I certainly didn't feel I felt I belonged. I have imposter syndrome probably 10 times worse than I would like to. And it was just wild, the things that I was doing and, and continue to do, that I, even though I don't believe that I could do it, I just do it. But then even with my own identity, like I've gotten quite extreme, I, I just sort of kind of find ways of just pushing what I think I am and who I think I can be. And I think, again, it all stems back to the stereotypes and the tropes that we sometimes get put in or we put ourselves in. And I constantly want to just go, why, why, why not? Why, why does that have to apply to me? Why can't I make up my own rules? Who told me that? Who, who told me that thing? Was it you? Was it me? Well, if it was me, then I need to get out of the way. If it was you, well, then you definitely need to get out of the way. It's that kind of attitude of like, don't tell me what to do. I'll work it out myself. And I've done that with everything. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Sophie Morgan, and this has been My Body, My Story. <laughs>